thing as a free lunch. And, and this is the proof. Um, because of kind of time constraints, I'm going to go right in here and I'm going to keep it as a, as a terse as is possible for me. Um, I believe that we are fooling ourselves if we believe that we are not any longer metaphysical creatures. <laughs> that we've somehow evolved to a point where we rightly believe only in a material reality. Uh, to be sure, we are living in a material world, as someone once said, but we can't even seem to agree on the nature of that world, let alone any transcendent world. You have your truth. I've heard not only my students say, but my colleagues, and I have mine. There is no objective truth. But the question of why two people can imagine for themselves two different diametrically opposed realities shows us exactly why the question of metaphysics won't go away. We can make jokes about metaphysics, and we frequently do, uh, but it's not going anywhere. And whether we're talking about a belief in God, or ghosts, or spirits, or UFOs, or WMDs that aren't there, we're talking metaphysics. And the fact that at this moment in human history, there are people who believe in God, and people who believe in ghosts, and people who believe in UFOs, and people who believe that somewhere, hidden in Iraq, or perhaps Syria, are weapons of mass destruction. And further, that all of these divergent opinions are given in our culture the same credence. This is symptomatic of our age, our worldview, and our postmodern condition. At the risk of oversimplifying a profoundly complex and important human cultural phenomenon, I think it's important to say that the mindset we call postmodernism represents a great turning inwards towards subjectivity and uncertainty about anything except one's own strongly held beliefs. While I have been reading various postmodern texts for the last three decades, and in fact find many of them to be very productive and helpful, I think nevertheless uh, it, it, uh, it never really hit me how unfortunate and potentially dangerous the postmodern worldview is for what we once at least called civilized society until very recently. And I want to share a couple of stories out of many in my personal experience that illustrate the type of danger I'm referring to. One day many years ago, uh, I was driving home from work, the Long Island Expressway coming home from Manhattan to Long Island in rush hour traffic. I was passed on the right in the breakdown lane by a very attractive young lady with blonde hair and sunglasses driving a brand new Mercedes convertible. The license plate said, Simply and boldly, IGMFY. Uh, for those of you who are not into acronyms, the first three letters stand for I Got Mine, and the last letter stands for You, and I'll let you figure out what the F means. Uh, here's the second story. Uh, I uh, knew a fellow not long ago who was assigned the duty of creating a mission statement for his organization. When asked if he was up to the task, this admittedly very nice and very capable and competent fellow answered, sure, that's easy. A mission statement, he explained, is really nothing more than plausible bullshit. These are, of course, anecdotes. My research, however, is not. It's concerned with the technological information environment that creates and supports the IGMFY worldview. The mindset that sees core values, the values that ought easily to be enumerated in an organization's mission statement, as having no more truth than any other self-serving statement in a culture saturated with advertising slogans. It's difficult for me to summarize in probably the 20 minutes I have left a work that took me 10 years to complete. So what I'm going to do today is in very broad strokes. Uh, describe the hypothesis upon which I based this work, the information I was looking for, um, and what it told me. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that even without the time to fully establish the argument, uh, that my description of the work will raise questions in your mind that you will want answers for. Then, of course, you'll buy the book. Uh, the metaphysics of media is predicated on the assumption that different media, because of their symbolic and physical forms, because of the ways in which different media structure information, 
and because of the biases with which they present us towards conceptions of either time or space. Media have historically helped to create and support different conceptions of reality. What's real and what's unreal. What we ought to know and what we ought to ignore. And consequently represent epistemologies, means and methods of knowing. This is important, I believe, because throughout human cultural and technological evolution, societies have moved further and further from epistemologies based on personal experience and relationships, and more and more toward an epistemology of mass manufactured and mass disseminated information. The human control over the process of what we call the social construction of reality has ceded to technological control. And what's worse, this has become a for-profit enterprise. And identifying and understanding the metaphysics of media is important, too, because people get hurt. They fall prey to exploitation, and they sometimes die when we allow ourselves to be visibly, willfully ignorant of the objective reality of life on Earth. Whether you see human intelligence and capacity for language as gifts from God or the result of 14 billion years of evolution, it ought to be obvious that an acknowledgement of objective reality and a vigorous pursuit of truth are absolutely critical to human survival. And so, in my work, I trace the evolution of communication broadly through three uh, uh, or four major eras of human communication. Orality, literacy, both scribal and print, and electricity. In each case, I give a description of the characteristics uh, of the media in, involved in each modality and how those characteristics influence human conceptions of being and knowing. So we start with oral culture. In an oral culture, all information is shared in interpersonal and group interactions through speech and preserved across generations from young to old in human memory. Oral culture implies significant intellectual and psychic pressures for its constituents demanding a total immersion in the momentary existence of the evanescent, spoken, and performed word. Orality limits scientific thought. Many researchers over the years have remarked that while pre-scientific thought certainly occurs in individual human beings, in an oral culture, change occurs as much by accident as by design. There's little room in the intellectual repertoire for new ideas since the very structure of oral society its origin, its purpose, its values, its mores, its mythology, its social protocol and relationships. All of these are preserved in constantly, almost liturgically repeated narratives. And it's in these narratives that we find the metaphysical power of orality to shape a reality for oral people. The oral mind linked the immanent, that which operates in some realm of reality, with the transcendent that which brings human understanding beyond the sensory, 